Welcome to yet another edition of the uh, Advisor Education Podcast. We, we actually call it Education Station. Uh, that's a little more fun, but it's our advisor education team. So I want to welcome Shelly and Chase here. Uh, we're going to discuss another, another subject, and that is why do advisors need an OCIO? Um, this really was brought about because of the fact that we, we wrote a blog post a couple of weeks ago and released that on our website, uh, of which I think that'll probably appear here in a moment. But uh, we wrote this blog post, and, and it's something that other questions have come in since then. And, and of course, it's it's just kind of a constant topic that we have to deal with and, and educating what is an OCIO? Where did this thing come from? What, what services are provided? What, you know, why should you, why should you ask questions about this? And that's what we're going to do today. So pretty simple stuff. Of course, always like and subscribe to the, the YouTube channel. We appreciate that. But uh, on that note, let's, let's try and dig in and give a little bit more clarity to that blog post that we wrote a couple of weeks ago. Shelly, uh, you want to get us kicked off with a little bit of industry background and, and where this you know, OCIO even comes from? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the blog post does a really good job of outlining um, some really key questions. But from a background perspective, when you look at the evolution of OCIO services, it's not something that's new, right? It's been around since the 70s and the 80s. And as anything evolved from a need to you know, give chief investment officer level um, services to smaller organizations, smaller pension plans, uh, nonprofits, small family offices. And then fast forward a few years later and you go through this lost decade, right? Um, <laughs> and now la larger, excuse me, larger organizations, um, say that 10 times fast, now realize the need that they need to have some OCIO, not only from just an oversight and compliance perspective, but also as they look to the next evolution of their practices. So it's really evolved. It takes many different shapes uh, as far as what can be provided. And so I think these, this blog you know, gives, uh, gives you some really good questions to start with. Yeah, that's uh, I, I would agree. And the, the real the real kicker here is until, I don't know, I'd say maybe five years ago, like I I, I never heard of OCIO uh, services really being pro or, or labeled that as such uh, to the ad regular advisor level. And that's kind of the kicker, right? That's why we're doing the podcast, just provide some extra meat on the bones beyond what was on the blog post. Um you know, just uh, my own flashback, right? When I first got in the business, I mean, I, I learned about the Frank Russell company doing this very thing for institutions uh, when it was the defined benefit world, right? Like JC Penney's wants to wants to take, <laughs> yeah. Hey now, pipe Red down. <laughs> uh, right after the invention of the wheel. Um, anyway, <laughs> so so it's it's one of those things, right? We we wanted to talk about where things are now and where they're going in regard to what kinds of uh, services this this really what what's really the value right what's the benefit of of trying to utilize these services as an advisor using a tamp uh in this uh, in this space and i think shelly kind of so, touched on it like the last decade i think everyone was trying to cut corners get cheaper make it more appealable um just for across the board but i think we're going back to you know a scenario where we have to show that value we have to show our worth so um, I guess, you know, I think OCIO is pretty evident why an advisor should u utilize it. But expanding a little bit on that, uh, what are the points that you, it always comes up in conversations for you, Jeff? Yeah, I mean, for from my perspective, right, I've been doing this a long time. And it's it's really about the fact that advisors don't have time to go look at a TAMP that has 500 or 1,000 different strategies and figure out what the best things are to use. And even if they do a fair amount of diligence and try and figure that out and find three or four good managers, they end up just at that point, it becomes a shortcut. I don't think advisors realize it, but it becomes a shortcut that they do 25, 25, 25, 25, or 33, 33, 33, right? Um, and from that standpoint, right there, there's more to be had. There's more opportunity there in risk and return when you understand how to combine strategists. And that's that's the kind of service level that, that we offer, uh, but not all TAMP services are like that. Let's I think it's good to take a step back and look at at TAMPs, right? The last five to 10 years, there's been a major push by most broker dealers and, and so forth uh, and their corporate RAs to move everybody to the TAMP space, right? The primary reason is so that it simplifies the whole business, right? There's one new account process, one service process, and you have access to lots of different managers. 
Uh, Shelly and I used to work in the direct solicitor space more or, or solely, I should say. And that was that was that scenario where you had to go out to each manager independently. And I think that's just not where the world is going. So this TAMP space to be able to get services where you don't have to learn about 500 strategists, but instead have somebody help you find three or four or five that are good for you and your business. That's the big, that's the big, big benefit here. And so then it's just a matter of, are you paying for it? Is it offered by the TAMP? Is it outsourced? Are you paying somebody else? So Shelly, what do you got? And, and yeah, I was just going to say, I remember years ago, you know, I would call you up and say, hey, Jeff, you know, working for another strategist and that direct solicitor, you know, this is what we've got going on. What do you think would would work well for this particular advisor? And you would just rattle off a number of different strategies. And that, I think, helped to complete the the full picture for, you know, where I was on that side of, hey, look, it can, you know, these can all play really nicely together and work really well for the clients from an overall investment philosophy perspective. So, you know, I always valued that about just even from my side of where I was with sure. your insight. Right. And that's, that's where different TAMPs, and let's just talk for just a, a brief second about the different kinds of services that are offered by different firms. And, and this, of course, is the ever-changing landscape, but most TAMPs offer what I call a basic uh, OCIO service. Uh, when I say basic, so let's say so like InvestNet, by default, they're they're using their PMC, you know, due diligence arm, which we've had a, a podcast ages ago about that, um, to narrow down the field. And certain firms get this extra special tag, right? It's been PMC reviewed and approved versus they're just available on the platform. And so there are some some broker dealers that maybe will only use or only allow advisors to use those that have been PMC approved. That's a very basic service. Right. But the the other levels are those things where you dive in and figure out what works for the advisor and, and really curate and make a custom curated list. So um, but there are a lot of them, you know, InvestNet does this. Uh, SmartX has capabilities. I know Pascal uh, will. Uh, I think they charge a fee. So so don't uh, don't quote me on that. But an extra fee if you want them to work and help you curate that list. Right. But the fact that it's even available 10 years ago, that stuff wasn't available. So uh, a lot of you check with your TAMP, right? And that's the, the point of the blog post is there are a number of questions that you should ask your TAMP about OCIO services so that you can be educated about what is or is not available, what is or is not uh, charging, you know, there's a there's a cost for it. I think that's yeah, a good point. Oh, excuse me, Chase. Right, go on, <laughs> Don't you love these formats of conversation? Um, yeah. I think it's a really, would be a really good question. I'd love to hear you answer it, Jeff, on... What advisor profile really benefits from the OCIO? We talked about the history of it and where they are now, but just in the trenches, what does that look like? Sure. Well, it's it's really about the advisor. I think the, the one that's going to, to appreciate this benefit or this service, uh, wherever that service is coming from, is going to be the advisor who has made the decision that their value is not picking an investment. Right. Their value is getting the client's financial life in order, doing the financial planning, maybe the tax planning, you know, making sure all the ducks are in a row. You got the beneficiaries in place and all these things coordinating uh, that that financial structure for the person. Um, if that's your value and that's where you can have an impact on a family, then spending your time doing due diligence on 100 different strategists is not a value. And so uh, whether it be whatever. Up, Jeff. It's What's just that? The, I think to take that to the next step, just the relationship, just making sure those communication lines are opened up so you free up time to, so you don't have to do due diligence. Maybe it is right. you're looking at the rest of the plan in the in totality, but just making sure you're, you're touching base with them a quarter, a semi-annual, whatever it calls for, just a simple email. You know, we, we always say it's so simple, but a lot of times people are just, <laughs> oh, we're too busy for it. And it's the easiest thing we can do and studies show time and time again, that's probably the most important to maintain those relationships. Yeah, absolutely. And this is part of the reason we created Insight by Potomac, which was on our first, hold on just a second, Not, yeah. Education Station podcast. There's the sign. Nice little plug there. there. <laughs> I got to do what you got to do. Right. But uh, you and I just had a meeting with uh, uh, one of our uh, good advisors, a uh, hundred million dollar office, and he doesn't want to be picking and choosing the individual investments. Right. His value is that financial planning, tax planning, et cetera. And so he's outsourcing to us to be able to keep him on track 
and, and say, what, what four, five, six different strategists should he use? What combinations are the best uh, for what his needs are and his clients? And then we meet once a quarter and go over those things and make sure that everything is on, on par. So uh, it saves him a ton of time and it, it just provides a better overall experience. So. I think it, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think one thing that, you know, we've been talking about the, the TAMP space, why it's important to you utilize the OCIO, but I think we bring a interesting, you know, a dynamic to the platform space where we're willing to provide some of these services for the platform. Um, I always think it's interesting. A lot of people are, are utilizing OCIO capabilities, kind of bits and pieces of it, but um, there's a lot more to it. So I think, you know, spreading this knowledge like we are, but also like lending on a hand when we can just shows the uh, the value in OCIO. And uh, I can't think of too many plat you know platform companies out there that are just willing to like, oh, shoot us, what does your 401k offering have through a client and let us run an analysis. We'll take you know, half a day, a day and uh, help you and help your clients strengthen that relationship. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm pretty young in this industry, Jeff, but <laughs> from my understanding, that's, that's pretty uh, unique, isn't it? It is. And, you know, the reality is it's just a matter of like what, you know, we have for our union UMA and for our platform users that are using our strategies in other places. It's just a service that we provide. And, you know, great that that's good for those. But if you're not using Potomac strategies or you're on some other TAMP and they have those services available, great. Take advantage of them. Trust me, it, it will it will very likely be a very good, uh, good benefit. Um, that said, what's the, you know, as we move forward, I mean, what's the space look like? I mean, I don't want to like go through all of the, uh, you know, uh, the blog posts that we wrote. Uh, so I want to take a look at what's it, what's the future look like, Chase? Do you have some insight there? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I hate saying we're always on the forefront of things, but um, we try but to we be, are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with inside and a lot of other offerings that we are uh, trying to accumulate and, you know, provide to our advisors. But I think that, you know, very well could be that OCIO becomes more popular on the platform space. And uh, just to eliminate some noise, make sure that your offerings are sound to your clients. Good point. Um, so that'd be my prediction. You know, I even though it's not common right now, I could see very much that OCIO becomes a household name within an advisor's office. I worked in a couple of advisors' office um, up until this point, and we never heard of a OCIO. We were kind of using it, but it was more like the buddy system, just giving us a ring down to yeah. the, the advisor at the end of the office, be like, hey, what's working with you? Awesome. And uh, I yeah. think we're really taking the next step here. Yeah. yeah, I think that well, puts us in a consultant ahead, position. I was just going to say, I think that gives us more of a consultant feel or gives anyone offering OCIO services that consultant role of get to know the practice, get to know the advisor profile, the client profile, and put together recommendations that that work and, again, save save the advisor time. So it's all about streamlining and efficiencies. To me, that's what OCIO is in and of itself, is the ability to streamline and add greater level of efficiencies to the practice. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Something, yeah, yeah, so that's yeah. a good point. Something we hadn't really talked about. Like I just got done talking to the head of marketing for, for a um, uh, broker dealer specific platform, which we are on. And, and just the fact that that understanding, it's not normal to hear of a firm who is just a strategist who is offering these services to essentially make recommendations to other third party managers. <laughs> like, yeah, everybody's supposed to That's have this favorite. dog eat dog mentality. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We think yeah. it works better to just make sure let's all work together and provide a better service, keep the advisor engaged, the client engaged and so forth. So, so um, this, something that I, something I wanted well, to jump quick, to. Jeff, though, I said sure, this on a phone it. call the other day and I, I always go back to about what comes around goes around. You know, we're, we're confident in our, uh, our offerings and we, you know, utilize or we can, um, really pinpoint what other people's strengths are. So, you know, uh, what comes around goes around. I think that resonates really well with advisors and, you know, us being confident in what we can do for them um, just bodes well for us. Yeah, uh, good point. And so there is another uh, item in this sort of futuristic, uh, what, uh, what what's coming in the forefront of, uh, let's say, the next five years. And I think it's fiduciary responsibility. Right. That's something that hardly anybody is talking about uh, that I have come across. Uh, but when I say this to advisors in individual conversations, it's like uh, sort of that light bulb moment. Like, wait a second. 
I've been just doing some quick, you know, flip a few filters, get a manager and there I go, or I've done some more extensive diligence and I've got a few and there they go. But what are you doing on an ongoing basis, right? That, that SEC requirement to understand that fiduciary responsibility, to understand what that strategist is, why you chose them. Are they still doing what they're supposed to do? Do you have all those policies and procedures in place? That's a question that every single advisor who uses um, a TAMP, right? And as outsourcing to, to other managers needs to be asking themselves. And this is one way to help solve that problem. Go ahead and let the OCIO group or entity or person do their thing. You get the diligence, you get the reasoning, you get the ongoing communication. And if the, uh, if the SEC or your broker dealer or, or whatever, the head of the RAA says, hey, what, are you be, what have you been doing to monitor these? Well, then you've got your ducks in a row. And I think that's going to be a big one in the next five to 10 years. That's going to become a more, a more common question in audits and so forth. Yeah. And I think that OCIO, here, we can coin, coin this expression if we like. Uh -oh. <laughs> TM it, right? OCIO is service, advisory service beyond the performance filter. Amen. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah it, it really uh, is. This might be a sidebar, but do you think the regulations are going to come down uh, as a byproduct? Is this crypto? Or is that a whole different conversation? I hate to bring that up, <laughs> but it's I'm, yeah. it's looking down the barrel one way or another. Yeah, I think it's all part and parcel to the same thing, which is we have a as as RIA entities, right? IARs of an RIA, or you have your own RIA, et cetera. You have a fiduciary responsibility to put the client first. And part of that is to also understand that it's not a point of sale like a brokerage scenario where it was good at the time and therefore it's okay. This is an ongoing relationship with the client and the strategist and the TAMP and the advisor. And so having those, uh, having someone to sort of quarterback that part of the process, save you time and yet keep you out of, uh, keep you in a, a better position to, to be a good spot for the client is, is a good deal. So, um, and, and on that note, Shelly, I think you had a, an interesting phrase you said the other day, something like, you know, if you want to improve the, the, or make the client sticky for an advisor, well, improve the client experience. Yeah. Right. Totally. And this is a great way to improve the client or enhance the client experience. So, yeah, I haven't met one on, advisor that doesn't want to do that, <laughs> that doesn't want sticky <laughs> clients, that doesn't want to. It's much easier to retain business than it is to go out and seek new. So keep the Absolutely. client happy, keep them engaged. And the more ways you can find to, to build that into your practice, then the better off you're going to be. All right. Well, as we speed through this a bit, let's uh, I want to ask, do either of you have uh, a, a good uh, one of your favorite questions? Um, from the I'll blog touch, post. I'll touch on mine real quick. I think I uh, hit mm -hmm. it pretty good, but just what is an OCIO? We hit it first and foremost, but so much in this industry, we throw around the same, like two different terms, but it mm -hmm. means the same thing. So just bringing clarity to the situation is it's always, you know, beneficial to both sides. So um, it, it led first for a reason. And uh, I think it stood, st yeah. uh, stood true. Yeah. Well, that's why we're an education team, right? So Shelly, what was your favorite question? So I, of course, had to be the, uh, you know, oddball <laughs> here. And I actually pulled the final question, which was the conclusion of what is the future of OCIO for advisors? And uh, so it says five questions, but that's technically six. So uh, what I would say the future is, is take a read through the questions. Ask yourself those questions about what the future of your practice looks like. Ask that of your TAMP and then see where it takes you from there. Perfect. All right. Well, we've got just a couple minutes left. Uh, let's knock out some recommendations. I mean, God knows we can't do a podcast without coming out with something uh, for a recommendation. So uh, Shelly, why don't you go ahead and lead first on this one? Okay. So I got a lot of flack on this, but I'm going to say it anyways. So mine is a fiction book called The Riviera House. And I like this book for a couple of reasons. I always read nonfiction. So it's very rare that I do pick up fiction. But first, I started out reading Agatha Christie, Love Mysteries. This is a mystery. Mm -hmm. The second is it's a, even though it's fiction, it's based on historical facts, uh, specifically around World War II. So my quick little um, spiel on it is this. The, as the Nazis occupied Paris, there was this big French resistance movement to save a lot of the artworks, some of which were looted by Nazis from prominent Jewish families. Fast forward to present day, and the Louvre is actually still undergoing uh, an effort to try and get those original paintings returned to their families. So it's got a lot of really cool historical references. What book awesome. was this again? 
The Riviera House by Natasha Lester. I'm going to say it does have a little bit of romance in it. It wasn't the primary theme, but um, I just loved the, the secrecy of it all, of, of how brave these people were in, in real cool. life. Of, you know, I'm going to take a pass on that, Shelly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, Chase is going to dive yeah. really mentally uh, deep on this one. You ready? Yeah. Fire away, Chase. What, what really mentally tough, detailed, excruciating thing are you dealing with? Hey, for a it's golf, but uh, it's actually disc golf. <laughs> so I grew up golfing. I grew up on a golf course, was privileged enough to have a um, membership. It was a terrible course, though, so it was dirt cheap, but still out there every single day. And uh, I'm too cheap to play the game now. So I picked up disc golf with my brother-in-law a couple years back, and the sport has exploded. So it's no longer that yeah. hippie down by the van. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's airing on ESPN, CBS, uh, guaranteed yeah. rights being a sponsor. So it, the game's going crazy. And uh, I love competing. I love improving myself. And I just love being out in the woods with my dog. So um, throw a couple <laughs> beers in my bag and I'm good for the day. I don't have to drop a hundred bucks per round. So uh, gotcha. through the pandemic, it grew like crazy because social distancing. So uh, it's not too late to pick it up and just take the family out and uh, enjoy it. Uh, it's I can't right. say enough good things about it. Cool. Well, that's, that's, I, I like the diversity in our recommendations. <laughs> I'm going to be a lazy ass on mine and I'm going to say, I, I'm not even going to take the effort to read. Uh, Netflix has a series. It's on third season. I guess there's a fourth one coming. It's called you and it is very mentally disturbing. Um, awesome. but, but I like it because the, uh, the, you know, bad guy, if you will, they've done a such good job of writing this sort of mystery drama, freaky show that you actually kind of feel bad for the guy occasionally. And, uh, and that makes me feel a little creepy. So, you know, I'm just telling you, it's, it definitely gets a little twisted and we'll leave it at that. And on that note, like subscribe, share, uh, tell your friends about us. We appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate the love. The education team is here to serve. And on that note, we are out my friends. See you guys. Choo choo. <laughs>